Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Christina, and we are pleased to welcome you to the Washington Labs Academy webinar series. We hope you find the next hour or so useful and informative. We have developed our webinar series to deal with some of the technical and administrative issues that our customers face on a day-to-day -day basis. We recognize that engineering challenges can be complex, and we're always looking for ways to support the technology industry. Before we begin, I want to go over a few housekeeping details. First of all, I hope everyone is able to see the title slide on their computer. We have muted everyone's microphone to keep the meeting quality as high as possible. A recording of the presentation is underway and will be sent to all attendees. We will go through all questions at the end of the presentation as time permits. A full screen view may be preferred. Your selection at your computer can be done using the menu panel. In the menu on your screen, go to View and then select Full Screen. We estimate that the main bulk of the presentation will take about one hour, and we will allow some time for questions at the end. We do encourage questions during the presentation. You can submit a question by enabling the chat icon at the top or side of your screen and typing your question to the host. And we'd like to hear from you. You can contact us via phone or email or you may contact the presenter directly. Send your emails to mikev at wll.com or markm at wll.com. And now I'd like to introduce our speakers. Michael Violette, co-founder and chief executive officer of Washington Laboratories Limited. Mike has 25 years of experience in FCC, CE, IC testing and certification. Mike is a professional engineer and an iNerdy certified EMC engineer. He is currently on the Board of, Educa of, <laughs> Board of Education, Board of Directors of ACIL and RABQSA. He has presented numerous live and webinar events on technical measurement and regulatory requirements for electronic devices. Mike is a notified body for the Radio and Telecommunications Terminal Equipment Directive, the RTPEV, and EMC Directive. In addition to his own insight, he will bring guest presenters into the webinar series to address subject matter, insight, and expertise. Mark Maynard is the Business Development and Communications Manager at ACB Inc. with a shared role in supporting Washington Laboratories in business and training arena. He has over 35 years of telecom, information technology, and compliance engineering experience. He also serves as the president of the IEEE Product Safety Engineering Society, is an INARDI certified product safety engineer, and an IEEE senior member. Mark lives in Austin, Texas, in the Austin, Texas area with his wife, Lisa, and is a graduate of Texas State University. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and hand over the presentation to Mike. Hi, Mike. Good afternoon, Christina, and thank you for uh, providing that introduction. And I'd like to start by uh, welcoming everybody to this webinar, Wireless Approvals in the Far East. As a young man, I always wondered what the Far East was because it seemed like uh, China and Vietnam and these other exotic places were in, were in the way west. But uh, I know now that uh, the Far East is a Eurocentric kind of designation. And of course, you have, if Europe's in the middle, then you have a, the Near East, the Middle East, and it makes sense to have Asia to be in the Far East. But that aside, we're going to cover the wireless approval requirements for 13 major Asian markets. And if you add up the population of all these economies, you come to something over 2.2 billion people, so roughly a third of the population of the planet. So it's a significant, growing, uh, increasingly urban market. It also is a largely attractive for mobile computing, mobile device management, as the economy shift to more and more e-commerce in many of these thriving urban centers in the in the Far East. So the way we'll do this presentation, and I will take the first couple of countries, and I'll ask my colleague Mark Maynard to cover a few other ones, and then we'll trade back and forth until we get through all these requirements. But as a sort of a stage setting uh, perspective, I'd like to look at some statistics from the FCC. 
Uh, these data are from the FCC's website showing the number of th certification activities uh, over the years uh, 20 to 2004 versus 2014. And we did a little bit of research and looked at the number of certif certificates granted in each of those years and tracked the growth of the uh, certification market. So for North America, the growth factor over those 10 years, about 5.1. Europe, a little bit higher at 6.3. And all of Asia, the growth has been about 4.7. The average global growth rate for the entire planet is about 5x over those 10 years, which is really a remarkable uh, expansion of wireless compute, wireless applications. If we just simply look at Asia, the top markets here, you can see that these data show that Japan doubled the number of certificates in those 10 years, Taiwan roughly a little bit more than two and a half, South Korea essentially even. But the most remarkable growth, and we've experienced this in our own activities over in Asia, has been in China where there's been something like 26x growth in the 10 years from 2004 to 2014. So we've experienced that. So we see the, ex the expansion of the Chinese test market as uh, very important and critical for our business and indeed in, in our daily lives. Especially as we source more devices from, uh, from those Asian countries. But they also can be uh, opportunities as markets open up and, and hopefully uh, trade will continue to be uh, fair and open. Um, we have opportunities here in other countries to uh, sell into these big markets. So I hope we can cover sort of the, uh, the beachhead here during our presentation. The good news is that most of the wireless spectrum in Asia and largely the uh, usage of frequencies and powers are largely harmonized with the rest of the world. This is, of course, a, a natural consequence of using international standards to design and develop products. The uh, Asian economies and regulators typically use uh, and utilize IEEE, 3DTPP, ETSI, and FCC standards, and they're largely technically harmonized uh, for most uh, accepted products. However, individual country-specific requirements may occur because of regional differences in spectrum allocation and management. The uh, spectrum resources of a country are sort of a, a national resource, and so they are like, they're, they're more often tightly, more tightly controlled than some other areas of regulatory activity. So today's topic is wireless and telecom approvals for these countries. Now, there may be other compliance requirements that you must keep in mind, such as uh, electromagnetic compatibility, which is tightly linked to wireless compliance but it's not a complete picture. Product safety, energy efficiency, uh, restrictions on hazardous substance, and many other requirements. So please use this as just a, a bookmark in your compliance planning schedule to uh, look at other things that may apply to your requirements. So first we'll go into the nation, the world's largest uh, country, uh, China compliance. We have, there's about 1.4 billion people in this uh, a very critical uh, trading partner of ours. And in general, there are three approvals that are typically necessary for an electronic device before it can be successfully placed on the China market. The first one, if it's a radio product, of course, is the State Radio Regulatory Commission, or SRRC, for wireless and radio frequency using devices. The other agency that may be involved in the regulatory compliance is the MIIT, which administers the network attachment license for telecom products. We'll discuss that in a little more detail in the next slide or two. And finally, the China Compulsory Certification for EMC and Product Safety Compliance. Now, the CCC mark is critical for a lot of consumer products and other things. It also applies to non-electronic devices, such as window glass and construction products. So it's a very large regulatory scheme, sort of akin to uh, FCC plus UL plus CSA plus NERDL type of activities here in the United States. Um, they also get into materials testing, and it's a very extremely large and complex organization. And it's because of that that there has been some difficulties uh, to administer what's called a mutual recognition arrangement uh, between uh, United States and China. And uh, that subject is maybe something for another time, but is 
intricately links the regulatory strategies that uh, U.S. companies must employ to gain access to that market. So first, the State Radio Regulatory Commission. Uh, up until, I think, about 10 years ago, it was the State Radio Monitoring Center, which was the China government's um, uh, listening post. They have uh, radio listening posts throughout the country, as you might expect, uh, for purposes of, of national defense and other reasons. And they administer regulatory requirements for all manner of radio communication, navigation, location, direction finding, basically anything that uses radio frequency spectrum to communicate equipment. Now, they do not have jurisdiction over industrial scientific and medical equipment, ISM equipment, and other things that use electrical energy but are not transmitting communications. Some abbreviations expanded here. The Ministry of Industry and Information Technology, MIIT, which is, uh, owns the number of uh, t testing laboratories, actually, that uh, do SRRC as well as other types of testing. Uh, they published radio regulations for RF transmit equipment just uh, back in 2010. SRRC is the certification body uh, akin to FCC in the United States uh, under the old regimen of uh, government-issued certificates. And a successful Application through MIT will result in the CMIT ID number, which is the type approval product label identifier once you gain certification. And the C stands for China in the CMIT scheme. The process is pretty straightforward. All the testing, however, must be done in country at an approved laboratory uh, that uh, MIT has recognized. And the process is uh, similar to other processes uh, for other certification and type approval activities. Uh, the product and the required documents would go to the laboratory. Depending on the complexity of the device, you might have one to three weeks of testing uh, and testing reporting. Then the documents are submitted to the SRC, which then may take a few weeks to assess and approve the application and issue the CMIIT ID number. Now, this is, comes along with a certificate that indicates the, uh, some of the technical aspects of the operation of the device and also has uh, the CMIIT number. The format of the ID label is shown here on this next slide. And basically, it indicates the uh, year of issue, the type of category, which is uh, cross-referenced to a table, and also has the whether it's uh, the manufacturer is a domestic manufacturer or it's an import. And then the last four numbers are a serial number issued by SRC. And this slide also lists a list of equipment category codes um, that would be embedded into the ID label. We mentioned the network access license. Now this is required of all basically any telecom product that's going to connect to the public utility. Uh, this may be uh, somewhat uh, akin to what we used to have to do in the United States for registration of equipment that connect to the public mains. However, this is expanded to uh, mobile devices and other uh, devices that may connect to the internet themselves. For example, public Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and uh, internet of things types of devices. So the NAL is a formal process you must go through to get your product listed. Uh, and here is a list of the type of categories that uh, China regulates under the network access license. And these include things like fixed telephone terminal equipments, fax machines, modems, signaling devices, backbone equipment, ISDN terminals, as well as fixed radio links that may be used in backhaul and other uh, types of communication links. The NAL certificate is shown here, and it is valid for a period of three years. So you must re reapply for the certificate after three years. The NAL mark is issued by MIT, which includes the certification number, model number, and a randomized code on the background. And this must be on the product. So a quick summary of China, there is a bureaucratic regulatory hurdle because in-country testing is required. 
I mentioned mutual recognitions arrangements a little bit ago, and this has been a longstanding objective of the U.S. Um, Department of Commerce and FCC and others to extend a bilateral uh, mutual recognition arrangement so testing can be performed in either country and, and the test reports accepted. Uh, so far, uh, this has not been successful. However, there was a recent effort this last year to get China to the negotiating table, which uh, was basically sidestepped. However, uh, that is, is what it is. Um, so you must plan if you're exporting a product to China for necessary delays that may take place during testing. Uh, you must send a sample to the China government approved testing laboratory along, along with uh, certain sensitive technical details. So you need to be wary about what kind of details you may release under that scheme. Um, the certificates are valid for, for three years. And uh, just a quick plug, we can help with this uh, activity directly in Beijing with our staff that's stationed there that interfaces with SRC on a regular basis. So going south to Hong Kong, Hong Kong is part of China. That's a special administrative zone. Uh, obviously has a long history of British uh, rule and uh, functionality, and a lot of that is still in place. Um, Hong Kong is a liberal country for, for radio frequency devices. There are regulations under OFCA, or the Office of Communications Authority. However, certification is voluntary. Uh, all wireless devices, except for a very few number, must are, are exempt from mandatory certification. They are based on common international standards. They do reference, for example, some FCC as well as some European standards. And currently, we do have a successful MRA with Hong Kong that's been in place for a number of years, which means that U.S. companies can test in, or companies can test in the United States. And also, there are designated certification bodies which are approved under the MRA to issue certificates. And our partners are ACB are one of those bodies. Go up to uh, a little bit east of China. Uh, we're going to look at some Japan certification requirements. There are four approvals that you must consider for Japan, depending on the type of classification. And some devices may uh, may must comply may have to comply with several of these requirements. But basically, the Ministry of Information Communications uh, is for radio and wireless, and they're somewhat akin to the FCC in the United States. JATE is for telecommunications compliance. This is for devices that connect to the public network. The Voluntary Control Council on Interference, which has been uh, functioning well for over 30 years, is a voluntary board that uh, issues re regulations and requirements for electromagnetic compatibility, primarily for information technology equipment. Now, VCCI, as by its name, is voluntary. Uh, however, you must test at an approved testing laboratory that is listed with the VCCI. And depending on your product, frankly, it, it's a market access or market recognition type of mark that uh, consumers tend to recognize on their consumer products. And finally, depending on your device, uh, you may have the Denon uh, product safety requirements for things like home appliances and power cords and those kinds of things. But in the wireless space, the main compliance agencies and organizations are uh, MIC, as I mentioned before, Ministry of Internal Affairs and Communications. Uh, the TELEC, which uh, branched out of MIC, uh, which is a certification body, which was historically the only method of getting certification in Japan until they liberalized and opened up uh, the certification to private companies. And then the Association of Radio Industries and Business, which writes a set of test and ter technical specifications, which are, we, we tell folks that they're basically an advisory standard. They're not the direct translation of some of the requirements. So you have to be careful about using the Arab standards. They're a great basis to start with, it, but the uh, English translations may not be 100% pure, but they're an excellent reference point. So under the U.S. and Japan Mutual Recognition Arrangement, which has been in force for around uh, almost eight years, I believe, um, 
we are allowed to form recognized certification bodies in the United States that can certify devices for the Japan market. And uh, our partners, ACB, have been doing this for a number of years. And it's segmented into two different sets of scopes, A1, A2 for terminal equipment, for your traditional plug-in-the-wall type of telecom equipment. And then the scopes B1, B2, B3 for radio equipment, licensed, unlicensed, and other uh, types of devices. For radio approvals, there are four main classes of products. There is a license-free and certification-free category, which I'll describe in a few moments. There's an unlicensed scope, which is quite broad and includes things like Bluetooth, cordless phones, low-power devices, typically the stuff that's under one watt, such as Wi-Fi wire, and wireless LAN. Then there's the license category, which would include mobile phones and things that either have a higher power uh, requiring licensing or have a network attachment requirement that would require licensing. And then there's a special code or a fourth code called special, which only MIT can approve. And an example of this kind of device are 13.56 uh, megahertz radio frequency ID equipment above a certain power. We get a lot of questions about RFIDs in Japan. And unfortunately, the this particular category is reserved for MIC only use. Now, there are ways to get it done, but you may have to go to a Japan laboratory and get that product tested in Japan. So a quick overview of the transmitter certification requirements for Japan. The governing law is chapter three of the radio law, which has regulations and the process for conformity assessment. And under that are a couple of ordinances which are regulations and procedure. This is some of the technical um, detail that you must follow and applicability of particular technical specifications to your device, such as power and uh, occupied bandwidth, operating frequencies, out of band spurious, these kinds of things. And a very uh, handy third party tool that we use is a RF database, which is uh, available from a third party uh, body organization in Japan that's closely affiliated with a test laboratory there. And basically it's an RF database that we often use to find out what the exact technical requirements are for certain types of devices. I mentioned Arib, uh, they have written uh, some standards and methods of testing. Again, a good touch point uh, for uh, point of reference for making measurements. The process is a formal process for certification where the assessment is performed by a conformity assessment in Japan or a recognized cer certification body out outside of Japan. And after the assessment is performed and successfully passes the requirements, a number is issued by the conformity assessment body or by the RCB, and a notification is issued to MIC, which is a pretty simple notification uh, where the uh, certification body has to show the equipment type and number, the certification number attached to that device. It's uh, no way um, anywhere close to the comprehensive amount of information that is submitted to the FCC, for example. It's a fairly short summary of uh, what the certification activity was. Um, for the certification body, it's mandatory that they hold all the technical information that they discovered during the certification. However, they do not have to disclose it to anybody. So under the Japan radio law, they talk about specified radio equipment. This is the designation that they use, the terminology they use for specific types of radio equipment. So whereas the FCC rules have a general uh, operating bands and things that can uh, perform in different places. Uh, the Japanese uh, radio law has specified radio equipment. They actually have uh, determined certain types of uh, operating things and then apply the regulations to that. And as I mentioned, uh, foreign certification bodies, recognized certification bodies can certify these devices as long as they use MIC approved standards and procedures or comparably equal standard methods. 
And for laboratories that are performing Japan evaluations, in order to have acceptable results, you must prove that you are doing the testing to equal or more comprehensive technical standards. And when uh, sort of views uh, the scope of a laboratory to determine we, they can do a cross-reference. And these cross-references can be to FCC specifications or ETSI specifications, as long as they are technically comparable. Now, there are three different categories, as I mentioned before. Um, we have unlicensed stations, and there's 17 classes under the uh, Article 38-2. There's a licensed station, which can include a blanket license, and 31 classes, for example, mobile phones. So a blanket license can apply to a type of equipment that may be used, for example, by a network operator or carrier where one license applies to many millions of, of devices that are of the same type. And finally, the category three is uh, license stations, which are other devices, and there are 75 classes. So things that uh, would fit in this category, for example, are, are fixed installations such as base stations or or point-to-point -point microwave links or other types of uh, infrastructure type of uh, transmission devices. And then there is a very low tra power transmitters, which is certification exempt. So your device, if it operates with a carrier frequency anywhere on this chart and anywhere under that field strength limit, which is a three meter test distance, you do not need to certify your device for Japan. If you look at these uh, limits, they are extremely tight and some of them are below the class B limit for CISPR and FCC. So you can do some radio frequency transmissions without a, a license, but it would be extremely short range and extremely low power operation. A lot of people ask if they can uh, do something called a modular approval. Um, Japan does not specifically speak about modular approvals. Their terminology is independent of host. And basically, a modular device can be approved under the conditions that are similar to the FCC's requirement for modular devices. For example, it must have a, uh, its own embedded antenna or fixed antenna, uh, has to have a defined high frequency RF section, modulation section, and <clears throat> control section, including the power supply. So these are, are basically the requirements that fall under the modular approval requirements for the FCC. So I mentioned the technical equivalents. Um, if you have a scope of, of testing on your laboratory's uh, scope of accreditation, if you can prove cross-references between the MIC requirements and the, your scope requirements, then you can demonstrate to a certification body that your testing has been done according to the MIC standards. Again, the methods must be as severe or more severe than MIC methods. And this is a, uh, just an example um, that we have used um, on our scope to show that there's cross-reference between specific uh, um, MIC requirements and the equivalent methods that we employ at our laboratory. These are some uh, additional examples of technical equivalents. And finally, uh, the label. A uh, specific label is required for Japan. It must have this uh, symbol. It's called the Jiteki mark. It has to have an R in a box. And then it would have a, a three-letter code that designates what the conformity assessment body number for that certification body is, along with a code that is issued by the certification body. And here's an example of a certificate, which would have the certification number, the ID number, the location of the, uh, the manufacturer, the specific ordinance, frequency, and um, other emission designation, for example. So now I will uh, hand the ball to my colleague, Mark, and he will turn his attention to Republic of China. Thanks, Mike. Uh, can you hear me okay, Mike? 
loud and clear. Okay, thanks a lot. Hi, I'm Mark Maynard. I'm the new guy on the block with uh, working with Washington's Laboratories and the American Certification Body. Well, I'd be working with Mike, and today we're going to be talking about uh, a few more countries in the Asia region. We've been covering the probably the most complex ones. The, the rest of uh, the uh, countries aren't quite as uh, complex, but just keep in mind the amount of material we're providing is kind of an indication of the amount of work that's going to go into getting those approvals. You've got to really follow their uh, program. So uh, kick it off with uh, uh, Taiwan here. Okay, there we go. So we're looking at two agencies here. For the wireless telecom is the National Communications Commission. And then for EMC and product safety, uh, if you've been in the uh, international approvals uh, business for a while, you know about BSMI. And they've gone through a few reorgers recent. But uh, today we're going to be concentrating on the NCC, although BSMI does have a lot of uh, resources out there too for you. So they're, uh, they have an English language version of their website located at this URL here. Uh, ncc.gov.tw for Taiwan and slash English. And it's uh, the country's designated authority for all radio telecommunication terminal equipment. So the frequency spectrum, everything the FCC does, all the phone system stuff, so they're kind of modeled on that. And then the force of laws given by the Telecommunications Act of Taiwan. So a designated authority and a regulating authority for telecom. And so this covers uh, also, the EMC product safety criteria that applies to telecom equipment. So, depending on especially if you're making stuff for central office uh, 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 phone uh, equipment that has to meet those fire standards and rack standards and all that kind of thing, you've probably got uh, a separate set of standards that are under there. Looks like the old, uh, uh, you know, Ma Bell AT&T standards used to be followed by all the telecom uh, equipment testers. So they're going to verify the competence conformity assessment bodies, and they're going to designate authorized uh, conformity assessment bodies, and they can, uh, you know, there's a police force for that. They can, uh, you know, withdraw a uh, designation, uh, the grant designations, and so they're the uh, controlling body for that activity. Now, uh, CNLA, uh, Test Lab Accreditation, stands for Chinese National Laboratory Accreditation, and if you're not aware, there's been, you know, uh, uh, if in Taiwan, they considered themselves a separate country that broke off uh, from China uh, following World War II. And, uh, and in China, they consider uh, Taiwan kind of a uh, rogue uh, a territory. There's, it's a, they're allowing a little bit of freedom to. Uh, no matter, they use, uh, so you'll see China show up in Taiwan, but it's not to be confused with the China, uh, China uh, the People's Republic of China uh, and their uh, CCC and SRRC agencies. So that's the, uh, just a little bit of verbal linguistics to uh, uh, keep track of there um, so you don't get yourself uh, looking at the wrong uh, sources of information. So uh, the Chinese National Accreditation Board, the uh, uh, CNAB, and uh, so they're going to designate all the authorized labs. Uh, you can become, a, uh, uh, with, through the MRA, you can become an authorized lab in the U.S. South Korea, uh, so uh, South Korea, Taiwan, uh, uh, China and, uh, you know, represents some of the more, uh, in Japan especially, uh, more robust requirements, very technically specific. You have to, you know, do everything the right way in the process uh, so you don't get applications kicked back. So they had some reforms uh, in their agencies and ministries, uh, uh, regulating ministries, in the, about three years ago. And so there's a, a new one, the Modi Ministry of Trade, Industry, and Energy is over their standards organization and then the ministry of knowledge economy is over the uh, uh the ministry of trade i mean it's been renamed now as the ministry of trade uh industry and uh, so that's the new uh, ministry that they're using for that's overseeing uh, for example the K, uh, kcc Commun korea communications commission so that's the EMC, rf and uh, you know wireless telecom authority so they control both sides of it, uh, you know, your, your wireless approvals, your MC approvals, everything's going through this agency now. Uh, and so the, uh, they have a new uh, name as the Ministry of Science, ICT and Future Planning, or MSIP. And so they've got a new uh, logo also that came well, three years ago was new. So under all that is the Radio Research Agency. So this is who we're going to uh, be going to to get our approvals. They've got an English language website. At the .kr for Korea, South Korea uh, designation, and uh, very similar to uh, uh, 
FCC testing, but with uh, some of the you know immunity testing that's been typical, uh, more with the European uh, standards and same basic uh, requirements as others. So they have a very specific uh, uh, labeling network too, and I've provided the code here. We won't go into details, but it tells you know. Uh, how it got certified, what kind of uh, product, you know, who's applying, so they can trace it back. They wanted a robust program, they can trace it back to the responsible parties uh, through the, that regulatory mark. They do have uh, SAW requirements, and uh, they are a country we have a, a mutual recognition agreement with the United States, so we can, uh, they can do FCC approvals, we can do RRA approvals in the United States as designated labs, and so uh, uh, similar requirements for SAR. But uh, for South Korea, those requirements are going to have to come from an authorized lab there. Indonesia is the fifth largest country in the world population-wise, and uh, a lot of people didn't know that. I was surprised when I read that the first time. Uh, they are a, a large number of potential consumers, um, and they do have a wireless agency, and it's pretty straightforward. Uh, this was DGPT for years uh, when I was working at a large ITE company for 20 years doing international approvals. That's what I dealt with all the time. The standards, uh, you know, the same process. They still got the same website, postal.go.id for Indonesia uh, domains. And uh, they basically got a, uh, you know, regulated areas, regulation scopes. And so the org chart's pretty basic. They just got these, uh, you know, regulations are based on these uh, three laws that they've got in the country. They're updated occasionally. Um, also, regulation scopes. So underneath each of those laws, there's different uh, regulatory bodies enforcing those that you see uh, played out here. But with an agent uh, in those countries, it would be real common to have a, a company that's getting the Indonesia, Malaysia approvals because right next to each other, Thailand, Laos, Vietnam, all those in that regional uh, area. And so they will have uh, agents that could uh, perform that uh, locally. Uh, as you know, a lot of uh, uh, test labs and certification bodies are in China and Taiwan, uh, along with uh, uh, ACB and other companies. So they uh, regulate everything from three kilohertz, three terahertz, or three thousand gigahertz, however you want to look at it. And uh, they, uh, you know, it applies to most uh, consumer electronics, anything used in wireless technology to communicate, similar to what you expect for FCC requirements. And hang on a second. I appear to have run out of slides. Is there a, have I lost my connection? Is anybody there? Hi, Mark. How many slides are you supposed to have? Oh, okay, you just came back. Uh, there is a, a whole other set of country. If you, uh, I think there's about 80 something slides total, 86, 87. Okay. So go to 80, 87. We can we can uh, share your screen, and then okay. if you have the slides there, oh on sure, the, on sure, computer. I'll do that. Okay, let's put it in presentation mode. Can you see it? Did you share your screen? Uh, oh, that's the wrong thing. <laughs> Should be up at the top. Share my screen. Uh, okay, I've got it. Okay, how about now? Perfect, thank you. Okay, sorry about that slight delay there. Uh, so we were talking about frequency management there. Uh, so labeling requirements, uh, you don't have to have special marks or labels or anything, they just want it, as you see down there in the sample, uh, the certification number, then that's the PPI for the agency, and then the year it was a certification is granted. And it has to be permanent and legible, and all those other things that regulatory labels are supposed to be uh, attached to the equipment and not removed without a great difficulty. Uh, you know, difficult to remove is usually most of the standards. So the uh, Director General of Postal Information and Communication Technology is the uh, uh, 
main uh, type approval regulating bodies, and so they're going to uh, uh, be over those type of approvals for wireless products, telecom products, anything connects to their information for telecom in, uh, interchanges. And then uh, Indonesian EU regulation of telecom uh, equipment certifications, um, and so they're just trying to make sure they've got standard products in their market. It's gonna, not going to negatively impact their phone systems or any other communication systems, you know, things like the typical things in most countries. They want their emergency broadcasters to be able to get through. And so now I think it's um, time to hand it back here. Let me get my... Hey, Mark. Yes. Mark, if, if you just keep control of that, we can advance through your slide. Okay. All right. So the next uh, part of our little world tour of the Far East, we're going to go south uh, to Australia and New Zealand. Next slide. Now, Australia and New Zealand obviously being very uh, relatively close together, although I think they're about a thousand miles apart, but, uh, separated by the water. Uh, they have had a mutual recognition arrangement in place between their two respective regulatory um, uh, operators, ACMA and RCM. We'll uh, talk uh, mostly about Australia because it's a larger market country and most of the global ma manufacturers choose the ACMA process to access both economies. Next slide. The Australia Communications and Media Authority is uh, the FCC analog, if you will, for regulation, regulate, regulatory body in Australia. And the New Zealand equivalent of that is the Radio Spectrum Management Administration. Next slide. Now, for a long time, the Australian ACMA compliance requirement consisted of something called the CTIC and the ATIC which uh, was for EMC and for um, communication type of devices. In 2013, they streamlined the whole process and combined the CTIC and ATEC into what they call the Regulatory Compliance Mark, or RCM. And the RCM means that uh, uh, compliance with the requirements or uh, the attachment of a RCM mark on your device implies that you comply with all the requirements that apply to your device, including telecom, radio communications and spectrum use, electromagnetic compatibility, and electrical safety requirements. And because Australia and New Zealand have an active mutual recognition arrangement, it also indicates compliance with the New Zealand RCM requirements. Now, a side word about uh, MRAs in New Zealand, it's uh, kind of curious that uh, China, as I mentioned before, had been in discussion with MRAs with the United States, which had been, uh, are now essentially halted. Um, but they have had an MRA for telecom with New Zealand. And I see that as uh, kind of sort of testing the waters. I don't think that uh, China sees uh, New Zealand as a particularly large threat to their uh, very powerful uh, electronics uh, in, uh, industry. So they're, they opened up an MRA with New Zealand to allow um, devices tested in New Zealand for access to the China market, which actually opens up a very interesting channel for people that want to access the China market. So in theory, you could test in New Zealand for Chinese compliance, and the test data should be acceptable. Um, that would be something to investigate if you're interested in that. A little bit circuitous route. Anyway, back to uh, back to down under the Australian ACMA compliance requirements. Um, oh, next slide, sorry. So ultimately, the C tick and A tick marks on these devices have been phased out. There's no more grandfathered approval allowed, which means that you must go to the regulatory compliance mark, which means that there is a database that uh, must, your device must be registered for all supplier identification requirements. Uh, the RCM certificates do not have an expiration and remain valid as long as the device remains unchanged 
and also the standards that apply to that device remain unchanged. In any case, in the regulatory world, if the standards change, you may need have to uh, revisit your your device compliance. And along those lines, we're having a, another webinar in two days on, on Thursday, which will address the new requirements for radio equipment uh, bound for Europe under the radio equipment directive. There's a lot of changes that are going in that regime. And if your markets include uh, Europe and you have radio devices, you may want to be a bit, have some interest in that uh, webinar. Uh, next slide, please. And then we'll move uh, a little bit, a uh, little bit east uh, to uh, Malaysia, which is uh, an interesting country split between the continental uh, China and also, I mean, continental Asia and uh, Indonesia. About 30 million people in that uh, very uh, um, distributed country, and the. Authority for Malaysia is the Malaysia Wireless Telecom Compliance Organizations is under CIRM. There are four web, couple of websites that we can find uh, some more additional information on CIRM. Next slide, please. But ultimately, CIRM is the National Standards Development Agency for Malaysia, and they participate in international standards. And they also are a technology research and development support agency. Next slide. The official organization that is uh, responsible for publishing the Malaysia Regulatory Compliance Standards is the Department of Standards Malaysia, DSM. Now, one thing that it's curious about um, the recent FCC changes in accreditation bodies and laboratory requirements and, and mutual recognition arrangements is that uh, Malaysia, is from my sources, has picked up on uh, pursuing a mutual recognition with the United States. Um, the results of those discussions are still uh, un unfolding, but apparently there's been motion there that uh, Malaysia may indeed have a MRA, active MRA with the United States, at least phase one uh, in the near term. Next slide, please. So for serum, if you're using this particular label, you must purchase these labels directly from serum. They must be placed on the product and they must be labeled in the factory if you comply with their requirements. Next slide. Okay. okay, so uh, Mark. yeah, okay, so we're talking about Vietnam and the uh, same uh, general region west of Malaysia. So they have the Ministry of Information Communications. Uh, they've really come into force over the past 10 years and uh, have uh, become a uh, de facto requirement as this marketplace has gotten bigger, more, more robust. Uh, they do have a English language uh, version of their website and a lot of information on there. Uh, you can get the laws, directives, uh, a lot of the test standards and every, uh, Vietnamese test standards you can download for free in PDF form. They've released over 20 new standards since 2010. So if you haven't been in this country before, you may want to do a little uh, study into getting acquainted with the standards. They're very similar to the uh, international, like you expect in Europe or United States. Same concerns with spectrum management, and EMC, product safety, uh, SAR requirements are uh, things that are starting to pop up. And so these are national technical regulations, and so that's what you've got to be testing your products to. You can find the listing of all the standards here. They do have strict labeling requirements, as most countries in this area do. Uh, uh, you don't have to buy from them, but you have to adhere to their artwork standards here with the ratios and all as shown. Uh, there's no uh, size restriction except that it has the, the normal, but it has to be legible and clear and easy to read with it unaided. You know, you can't have to have a microphone, microscope to look at it or something. It's got to be uh, able to see with uh, somebody with 20-20 vision in normal lighting conditions. Next is Singapore. And uh, it's at the very tip of Malaysia. It's a very small country in land size, but very large in population. 
a lot of business and commerce, a lot of corporations headquartered here. So there's a lot of fluent customers, good market to be in, depending on what you're selling. Uh, so they've got a new name, the Infocom Media Development Authority. Uh, before it was Infocom Development Authority, or IDA. Now it's the IMDA. I guess they had to build in the media, as that's become more and more uh, apparent with the uh, – everything's got a display in it now, and uh, all the uh, different uh, types of video and uh, voice and data transmission that are going on with all these products. I want to make sure they're covering all that. So you have two basic laws, uh, regulations, these uh, – Info Communications Media Development Authority Act, Telecommunications Act, and you can access those online at the uh, URL given there. The uh, Singapore Compliance Standard for both the uh, TTT and radio wireless uh, technologies can be downloaded there as well. So they've got a really good website, provides these standards, and you can reference them and study them uh, as you want to. And uh, you need to make sure that, uh, you know, is, is general uh, expectations you'd have for international standards for wireless uh, and, uh, equipment, but you got to make sure you're not stomping on any of their emergency or military bands. Philippines is uh, the second to last country we're going to cover today. Manila is a uh, long ally of the United States, very uh, instrumental in World War II. Uh, they've got national telecommunications uh, commissions modeled on the FCC. They've got a bunch of information on their website, uh, which is in English. And you can uh, download, uh, you know, the uh, actual uh, laws and regulations from the info drop-down menu on their website. So FCC reports are taken as proof of the compliance. So basically, you just got to bundle up a copy of your that uh, FCC report with your uh, application. The agent's probably going to handle for you and uh, get that uh, uh, proved through the agency. They've got a specific uh, label. Sorry for the uh, poor quality here. Uh, but this, uh, uh, they don't want it, uh, you know, where somebody could copy it. So it's uh, the ones they have for display are kind of uh, blurred like this. But they've got specific set of artwork requirements. If you've got an approval, they'll send it with the approval. And so your artwork has to match that. It does not have to be in color. Uh, it can be, you know, the blue and the red can be gray. Uh, so uh, that's not a uh, hindrance if you want to do black and white labels. Um, and then uh, last country we're covering today, Thailand. It's uh, got a growing market and uh, economy. They do have an uh, English language version of the website. They're really primarily interested in wireless uh, telecom, and so that's uh, what they – they don't have separate EMC or product safety agency, anything like that. Um, and then uh, uh, they have uh, all these the same uh, things you saw with Philippines. You can reference all the frequencies, uh, bands and that are authorized the, with the power ratings and those kind of things. So in conclusion today, uh, I want to thank y'all for uh, joining us, but the, uh, I'd recommend if you're in the international approvals uh, business, I was with a uh, one of the top three uh, ITE companies for over 20 years, and uh, international approvals was critical to uh, getting our company success and maintaining it. Uh, so uh, you need to create your own network of people that know stuff about this. One of the best places I've found that is the IEEE societies. Uh, for instance, I belong to the uh, EMC Society and Product Safety Society and Consumer Electronics, Microwave Theory and Techniques, and it provides information and network and contacts, and this is uh, really good. Uh, LinkedIn groups like uh, uh, IOT uh, T International uh, Compliance uh, are good groups where you can uh, share information online with uh, you know, uh, your peers in the industry. If somebody hears something about a new Russia approval or something, they can post it there and let their colleagues know about it and uh, to try to maintain a network that way. Uh, you can also get uh, uh, compliance updates from us with Washington Labs. We have social media. We have e-blast emails that go out with information on our websites. Uh, we're expanding our presence on the LinkedIn and uh, 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 Facebook and Twitter, and so we'd love to hear from you about that. Uh, if you have any product needs that you want to talk to us about, we have, uh, you know, radio frequency testing, that wireless approvals, uh, product safety, machinery, environmental EMC, uh, private third-party lab, uh, and our, uh, uh, we have a partnership with the American Certification Body that's, uh, sort of, that can uh, grant those FCC and uh, EU approvals and other things along those lines where they're authorized. And uh, you probably know they're very experienced. Let us know if we can answer any other questions. But uh, I'll open it up for questions at this time. 
Hi, Mark. Um, looks like we have a few questions in. Uh, the first question, what is the most frequent issue encountered in obtaining Far East approval of a wireless device? Well, my experience is making sure that you have the, uh, you know, the right, uh, you've got to make sure you're using authorized labs and that you've got the right report format. Uh, it's, it's, it's referencing the current standards. It's all the details, making sure that the, uh, those agencies are, are, are sticklers, uh, the, especially the larger countries, there's real sticklers for the details of what the requirements say, you know, which, uh, what information has to be in there, what documenting photographs, uh, those types of things. So that's why it's important to uh, uh, work with somebody's experience to make sure you're going to get those in a timely manner. Mike, do you have anything to add? Well, I think I echo that trusted partner aspect of your last comment. Uh, the, the other a uh, thing that uh, th makes things a little challenging is getting samples if there's in-country testing and making sure that they operate correctly and are easily set up by the lab technicians. Uh, this is can be a hurdle for uh, remote uh, remote testing. So again, having a, a competent, uh, trusted partner in a target country uh, helps a, a great deal that they can resolve technical as well as some of the administrative issues that may come up. Okay, that sounds good. Um, looks like, okay, Mike, I think this question is directed toward you. You were talking about Japan compliance. Is VCCI compliance required for wireless devices? No, it applies to general electromagnetic compatibility requirements for non-intentional emitters, information technology equipment, that kind of thing. But it, it's a voluntary requirement. You must have an MIC approval if you have a radio transmitter, but you do not need VCCI. Mike, I, I will say you, you just touched on that it was uh, might be a marketing requirement. Uh, this is what uh, uh, you know the uh, marketing requirements in Japan are driven by. Large corporations want that VCCI on it, and the uh, government uh, agencies want that also. Uh, and so uh, if you're a Dell or an HP or a large corporation like that has, really wants to get to the uh, corporate markets where they're buying, you know, tens or hundreds or thousands of, of units at a time, uh, that it becomes a de facto requirement just because uh, you're not going to make those sales if you don't have it. But if you're a small, you know, consumer electronics pro product and that corporate market isn't for you, uh, you know, then, the, then uh, it wouldn't make sense to get it. Okay. Um, we have another country specific question. Uh, this one's for Australia, New Zealand. Does the RCM require you to be in the country? No, but uh, you must designate a representative in country in Australia or New Zealand. And their obligation is to carry the compliance package, whatever that might be. And that's in case of any questions from market enforcement authorities or customs. Okay. Um, looks like I've got one more question here. Which countries require in-country testing to support the approval? Well, it depends if, uh, I mean, if you've got labs that have uh, MRAs in place for those countries that allow it uh, for like, you know, Japan or Taiwan, uh, you can test, uh, you know, in the United States at labs that are designated, but uh, however, for China, that requires in-country testing. Uh, for uh, Taiwan, certain types of equipment will require it. Uh, it's, uh, it just depends on the country. Yes, the countries with active phase one or phase two MRAs will accept test data from other, their respective laboratories. And then there's some countries that don't have MRAs uh, that may accept test reports, such as, uh, as Mark mentioned, the Philippines. They will accept existing certification. So it really is a country by country uh, specification. Okay. Well, thanks, Mike and Mark. Um, looks like I have answered all of the questions up to this point. Uh, if we could, I'd like to quickly go over some information on upcoming training from Washington Labs Academy. Let's 
So you can link to us online at WLL.com forward slash US forward slash Academy. And that's the link displayed here. You'll find information on about all of our webinars and resident courses available on a variety of engineering design and testing topics, some of which we have listed here. Uh, session 12 of product safety, that's next week, Tuesday, December 13th. We're going to discuss routes to compliance. For our MEL standard 461 EMC, session 12, that's Wednesday, December 14th. We're talking about documentation. For our environmental MEL standard, session 12 is on Thursday, and that's going to be covering MEL standard 167 and 901. For our wireless compliance series, the RED implementation will be this Thursday on December the 8th. Also, there's a couple of happenings for 2017 coming up. The IEEE Symposium on Product Safety Compliance Engineering, the date is set May 8th in San Jose, California. And the IEEE EMC Signal and Power Integrity Symposium in Washington, D.C., that's happening the week of August the 7th. So all of our webinar and resident courses are available for purchase from our Academy website. If you're interested in checking out any of our previous webinar, please note that all are available for purchase from the Academy website. We also provide customized training at your place or ours. Be sure to visit the Academy training page to check out the latest course topics and dates. And I'd like to also remind everyone, we'd love to hear from you with suggestions on future topics that we might be able to present. Um, I see we have one question coming in. Will we be getting a copy of these slides? Absolutely. Everyone who has attended our webinar today will be getting a copy of the presentation as it has been recorded. So let me see if there's any other questions for you folks. I don't see any other ones. I think that uh, this is going to conclude the webinar today. Thank you, Christina. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, all who attended. Yes, thanks, everyone, for your attendance. Um, thank you, Mike and Mark, for a good presentation. And on behalf of myself and Washington Labs Academy, I'd like to thank everyone for their attendance. And I'm going to go ahead at this point and end the event. I hope everyone has a good afternoon. And bye-bye.